to join the room and, and then we can get started. Okay, great. Well, we can go ahead and get started and then some more people can join while we do the introduction. So welcome everybody. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, Becca Franks and I are thrilled to be hosting this talk on behalf of NYU Animal Studies. So just a little bit of background about us and what we do, and, and then I can introduce our speaker and tell you about today. So first of all, uh, animal studies is a multidisciplinary field that examines what animals are like and how human and non-human animals interact and the moral and social and political and economic and ecological and aesthetic, et cetera, significance of animals and our interactions with them. And so we have an animal studies program here at NYU. We have an undergraduate minor and a graduate MA program. And we also work as part of a broader environmental studies department that has an undergraduate major and minor. And we work with the NYU Center for Environmental and Animal Protection, which conducts and supports high quality research about important issues at the intersection of environmental and animal protection. And so you can find out more information about our community and sign up for events at our website. And of course, feel free to contact me or Becca or other people in our program if you have any questions about us. Okay, with that said, I want to thank uh, the Brooks Institute for Animal Rights Law and Policy for their generous support of this series of public talks. This is the third talk in this Brooks sponsored series and we could not be happier with it. So thank you so much for supporting this and other things that we do here. And uh, now, to let you all know what to expect from the session today, we have about an hour and a half together and I will shortly introduce our speaker and then there will be about a 40 to 50 or minute or so presentation. And then after the presentation, there will be a discussion that will be based on questions that you will be submitting in the Q&A tab during the talk. So, so throughout the talk, feel free to type any questions that you have into the Q&A tab feel free to upvote or comment on those questions. And then Becca will be selecting questions to pose to Doug based on which questions seem to be most popular, most upvoted and commented on. Uh, so, so that will be what the session is like. And then of course, you can always follow up with us after the session too. Um, with all of that out of the way, it is my honor to introduce our speaker for the session. Doug Kaiser is Joseph M. Field 55, professor of law at Yale Law School and faculty co-director of the Law, Ethics, and Animals program at Yale Law School. His teaching and research areas include torts, animal law, environmental law, climate change, products liability, and risk regulation. Kaiser was previously on the faculty at Cornell Law School, received his BA, summa cum laude, from Indiana University in 1995, and his JD, magna cum laude, from Harvard Law School in 1998. Following law school, he clerked for the honorable William G. Young of the United States District Court for the District of Massachusetts. Doug will be giving a talk today called Unimaginable, Hope and Duty in the Anthropocene. So thank you so much again for joining us, Doug, and looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Jeff, thank you so much for that introduction. And um, thanks in advance to Becca for the conversation that I really, really look forward to having with her. I'm extremely grateful to the NYU Animal Studies Program and to the Brooks Institute for Animal Rights, Law and Policy for organizing and sponsoring this event. It's a real pleasure and a privilege to have the opportunity to engage with you today. I have great uh, admiration for the research, the teaching and the training that goes on in the NYU program. And with the increasing engagement of our respective programs through support of the Brooks Institute, many of you have become friends in addition to academic heroes of mine. So this is truly just a, a treat for me, which makes it all the more unfortunate that my topic today is such a drag. Um, because uh, Jeff and Becca invited me to speak on the intersection of climate change and animal lives. And that intersection stands at the corner of Crisis Street and Cruelty Boulevard. So it's hard for me not to be a bit of what my students call a Dougie Downer in this talk. But I will try to end on an uncharacteristically upbeat note for me, I promise. So here's what I'm going to do in the talk today. I will first lay out some basic facts, 
about climate change, including some facts that you already know, some that you might not know, and some that are resistant to being known. That is some that resist being fully grasped and appreciated no matter how many times we hear them. After introducing the unimaginably large and rapid changes wrought by humans to the Earth's atmosphere, I will then consider two other of what I call Anthropocene unimaginables. First, how can we locate hope from within the institutions and ideologies that gave rise to our present sense of hopelessness? And second, how can we conceive of our responsibility to non-humans in a world that is literally saturated by the human? The former top topic will be gestured at um, primarily through a thought experiment involving carbon offsets. And the latter topic will be gestured at primarily through a short story about a newt. Okay, first, some brutal facts about climate change. Scientists have understood for a long time that the addition of carbon dioxide, which is the principal greenhouse gas emitted through human activities, could result in a warming of the Earth's atmosphere. Perhaps the earliest experimental demonstration of this fact was reported in 1856 in the American Journal of Science and Arts. The experiment was conducted by Eunice Newton Foote, a scientist, inventor, and women's rights advocate from Seneca Falls, New York. Her findings were read before the American Association for the Advancement of Sciences at that organization's annual meeting. They were later published under the title, Circumstances Affecting the Heat of the Sun's Rays. It's noteworthy that her paper was read at the meeting by a male scientist from the Smithsonian Institute. Some historians speculate that Eunice herself would not have been permitted to deliver the paper. Nonetheless, through her study of sunlight's effect on different compositions of gases sealed in vacuum tubes, Eunice Foote unequivocally demonstrated that increases of carbon dioxide in the air increase the Earth's temperature. It wasn't until the middle of the 20th century that scientists began to monitor atmospheric carbon dioxide concentrations directly, most notably through a research station atop a mountain in Hawaii that was established by the great climate scientist Charles Keeling. That data series, along with others that would follow, shows an inexorable rise in CO2 concentrations, interrupted only by the slight ticks up and down that accompany the seasonal cycles of plant growth and decay. A similarly dramatic rise has now been documented with respect to methane, a potent greenhouse gas, the rise of which is tied in substantial part to the enormous rise of industrial animal agriculture throughout the world. Over time, scientists have linked the increase in atmospheric greenhouse gases to human activities, primarily the combustion of fossil fuels since the industrial revolution, but also large scale land use changes such as deforestation and as just mentioned, industrial livestock. Scientists have worked mightily to disentangle the human-caused or anthropogenic influences on radiative forcing from other influences such as solar cycles, volcanic activity, cloud cover, and so on. At this point, it is not disputed that the human contribution to radiative forcing is substantial and increasing. It also is not disputed that, as the 1856 experiment by Eunice Foote predicted, the climate has been warming. And the bulk of that warming, especially since the so-called Great Acceleration following World War II, is attributable to human activities. Here is a more intuitive way to visualize the temperature increases that the Earth has experienced over the last century and a half. There will be a pause in the animation when we get to the present date, followed by projections for the remainder of the century. Now, everything I've said so far, with the possible exception of the unheralded role of Eunice Foote, is probably well known to this audience. What I want to say next may not be, but it's absolutely crucial to a full understanding of the climate change problem. If I were given a chance to present just one slide on climate change to the entire world, I would choose this one. 
Unlike most discussions of climate science and policy, this slide places our current predicament in the context of the deep, long history of the planet. Paleoclimate scientists use ice core samples and other methods to reconstruct the level of atmospheric carbon dioxide and the average temperature on the planet, stretching back over 400 million years. And what they've learned is that we are currently at a level of atmospheric CO2 that has not been seen on the planet for 3 million years. At that time, 3 million years ago, sea levels were around 50 feet higher than they are today. On our current trajectory, by the year 2050, we will hit a level of atmospheric CO2 not seen on the planet for approximately 50 million years, back to a time when palm trees were found in Alaska and crocodiles swimming in the Arctic. If we continue on for another century or two at our current rate, we may have to look back some 200 to 400 million years to find an analogous period in our planetary history. 250 million years ago was a time period known as the end Permian mass extinction, a time when geologically dramatic and rapid increases in greenhouse gas emissions triggered changes that killed off more than 96% of marine life and 70% of terrestrial life on earth. These are grim facts and I'm about to make them worse. If I were given the chance to present a second clim climate slide to the world, I would choose this one. Few people outside the climate science and policy world appreciate that many of the official projections that you hear about, despite being depressing in their own right, are actually quite conservative in their orientation. The official processes are deliberately structured to endorse only the most well-characterized, supported, and replicated findings in the scientific literatures. But scientists have long urged the world to appreciate that within the Earth's systems exist tipping elements that must be reckoned with, even though they are difficult to predict and model in the neat fashion often sought by policymakers. Indeed, over the last year, increasing evidence seems to show that some of these mechanisms may now be active, perhaps even irreversibly so. For example, the boundary between the Arctic and North Atlantic oceans is becoming blurred by warming oceans and freshwater inundation from ice sheet melt. Eventually, scientists fear the Great Atlantic conveyor belt might shut down, bringing a change in ocean currents with massive implications for marine life and weather patterns the world over. Two tipping elements deserve special mention because they threaten release of greenhouse gases that will themselves further enhance climate change. The Amazon rainforest contains literally billions of tons of carbon sequestered in trees and other plant life. To understand the Amazon, one needs to understand that a single drop of water evaporates and precipitates numerous times as it travels the course of the river, bathing the ecosystem with moisture. It's said that trees in the Amazon make their own rain, but with enough increase in temperature or enough deforestation due to for forest fires and logging, this vast system may rapidly tip from a wet rainforest to a dry savanna equilibrium releasing in the process, those billions of tons of carbon, which in turn will exacerbate climate change even further. And as if that is not terrifying enough, a recent landmark study examining the whole inventory of greenhouse gas changes associated with the Amazon, not just carbon dioxide, suggests that major portions of the rainforest already have become net sources rather than sinks for greenhouse gases. Similarly, we have begun to see worrying signs that the Arctic is moving into a new state characterized by an unprecedented heat and by wildfires. Last summer, a town in Siberia hit 38 degrees Celsius, the warmest temperature ever recorded above the Arctic Circle. With this new Arctic normal comes the risk that vast amounts of carbon dioxide as well as methane stored in Arctic permafrost or submerged within frozen hydrates and lakes and seas will release into the atmosphere. Now, from a lawyer's perspective, what makes these two tipping elements so worrisome is that they represent sources of greenhouse gas emissions that cannot, at least as I can currently imagine it, cannot be regulated. Even if we waved a magic wand and adopted an aggressive global climate change policy tomorrow, we might still have no way of stopping release of methane from Siberia or carbon from the Amazon. Finally, scientists increasingly speculate that a tipping point may already have been reached with respect to the Greenland and West Antarctic ice sheets, such that we are committed to meters of sea level rise and to an eventual return of the coastlines of 3 million years ago. 
even East Antarctica is beginning to show signs of glacial collapse, which means that vast ice sheets anchored on land may also become destabilized, findings which have led scientists to revise dramatically upward their projections for potential sea level rise during even this century. Indeed, some scientists have become so alarmed by these findings that they've proposed seemingly fantastical engineering projects, such as building a 100 meter high underwater berm around Antarctica that would separate a cold coastal body of water from the warming oceans, hopefully delaying the inevitable melting of the frozen continent. The idea seems laughable, outlandish to us, but the scientists proposing it are not laughing. They're driven by a sense of moral desperation. In the face of nihilism, they're using their knowledge and expertise in creative, audacious ways to meet the scale of the challenge before us. One question I'd like to pose for our consideration today is, what actions and proposals would follow if the rest of us behaved similarly, if we sought in the face of potential nihilism to use our knowledge and expertises in creative, audacious ways to meet the scale of the climate challenge before us? Because tipping point scenarios are uncertain and nonlinear and just generally hard to get your head wrapped around, they're typically not included within the official climate projections that are distributed for policymakers and public consideration. The upshot though is clear, it is later than we think. Because of the extraordinary inertia and nonlinearity of the climate system, we are entering uncharted territory, no matter what choices we make. We are sledding on melting ice, and for the foreseeable future, we must live knowing the ice may break beneath us. How to operate in such a fragile terrain? Obviously, one aspect of the mission going forward is to help officials and decision makers identify and implement appropriate climate change policies, laws, and regulations. But to be honest, that seems like the easy part to me. We know a great deal about what technologies, behavioral changes, and policy tools are needed to speed the transition to a net zero emissions economy. What we don't know is how to get those technologies, changes, and tools adopted from within the institutions and ideologies that we've inherited. As noted at the outset of this talk, scientists have understood the basic physics of climate change since at least as early as the 1860s. Perhaps more alarming is that the federal government in the United States, in turn, has been warned about the potentially catastrophic effects of climate change since at least the 1960s. Every US president since John F. Kennedy has been given high level briefings and reports detailing the catastrophic consequences that would follow from continued combustion of fossil fuels. This is a report from the National Academy of Sciences in 1962, which describes quite clearly the climate change problem, its causes and its potential effects. Importantly, the report also includes a clear and unequivocal policy response, maximum utilization of solar energy. Here is testimony from a Senate committee hearing in 1963, describing carbon dioxide as a form of air pollution and warning of violent air circulation and more destructive storms if we continue to emit CO2 and contribute to climate change. Lyndon Johnson gave a presidential address on environmental issues in 1965, which cited the steady increase in carbon dioxide from burning of fossil fuels as a major threat to humanity. A scientific report to the president in that same year called carbon dioxide from fossil fuel combustion the invisible pollutant and warned that when within a few short centuries we are returning to the atmosphere carbon extracted by plants over a half billion years. This process, the report noted, would produce marked climate change. These warnings are from the early to mid 1960s, and they have been repeated at the highest levels of scientific and policy communities every decade since. Yet over that same time period, essentially nothing was accomplished by way of policy and action to arrest the growth of greenhouse gas emissions. Remarkably, when we go back to that 1965 report to the White House, it includes a very prescient projection of how much atmospheric CO2 concentrations would rise over the ensuing decades if nothing is changed. The report also forecasts the very predicament we find ourselves in now, which is that without a concerted global effort 
to decarbonize national economies in an almost unimaginably rapid timescale. We're left with the prospect of geoengineering as a regrettably necessary option to put on the table, a prospect cautiously endorsed by the National Academies in an important report released just this week. Again, how did it come to this? At any point during the last six decades, if the US Congress had the will to do so, it could have reached the vast majority of this country's greenhouse gas emissions by regulating just a few thousand entities through an upstream carbon tax, a legal change that would instantly alter international negotiating dynamics for other major emitting nations. The federal government still today could start collecting this tax tomorrow if it passed bill today. The necessary entities are already subject to special tax reporting and collection regimes. We would just need to change the code. And tomorrow we could also start returning the economic value of the carbon tax to individuals through a linked reduction in payroll taxes. The logic of such a policy is simple. Tax bad things, not good things. Pollution is bad, employment is good. I have lots of criticisms and reservations about carbon taxes when they are proposed as an exclusive approach to greenhouse gases. But as part of a suite of policy tools, the case in favor seems overwhelming. So why have we failed to adopt an obvious and effective policy that would have helped to fulfill our urgent and undeniable climate responsibilities? Again, how did it come to this? Well, the answer is complex, um, but a lot has to do with wealth and power. Researchers estimate over tri $20 trillion worth of known fossil fuel reserves exist above the two degrees Celsius temperature target that the UN Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has warned would be catastrophic for humanity to cross. That's $20 trillion worth of reserves that are owned. They're on the balance sheets. They're counted as assets in someone's ledger of wealth but that cannot be burned without entertaining climate disaster. It's hard to imagine power walking away from $20 trillion without a fight. Yet, that is precisely what needs to happen in order for us to have a chance of containing and managing suffering. Here's a messy slide, but it gives an important vantage point on the scale of the problem. It depicts the world's emissions trajectory as of policies in place in 2005, steadily growing as of the date of 2019 policy scenarios. And then two additional projections based on pledges submitted by countries under the Paris Agreement. The unconditional pledges in which countries agree to take policy actions irrespective of whether other nations take comparable actions and then the conditional scenario, the more optimistic one, in which we have more robust policies adopted because all nations comply with their pledges. The important takeaway, though, from all this is that none of these trajectories are anywhere near the level of reductions that are actually needed in order to have a chance of staying below one and a half degrees or two degrees Celsius. And unfortunately, when we look at the recent history of anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions, we don't find reason for optimism that these trajectories can be torqued in the necessary way. Since the Industrial Revolution, the only reliable way to reduce global emissions seems to have been through economic collapse or war or pandemic, which are obviously unacceptable ways to approach climate policy. Although greenhouse gas emissions did drop for a period during early 2020, due to the vast economic and social shutdowns adopted during the COVID-19 pandemic, those reductions were temporary behavioral changes rather than durable structural transformations. We're once again back onto our unsustainable yet seemingly inescapable upward trajectory. So in sum, we are many, many gigatons short of ambition. If instead we wanted to imagine what our emissions paths would look like, if we tried seriously to hold to one and a half degrees of warming, it would look something like this. Now, assuming we don't have access to some miraculous negative emissions technology that could draw down existing concentrations of CO2 from the atmosphere, then we instead need to begin a process of fundamental and rapid transformation of nearly every sector of modern industrial society. In truth, transformations are coming one way or another. 
they will come violently and unexpectedly through the impacts of climate change, or they can come, or and they can come with foresight and deliberation through efforts to ward off the worst effects of climate change. Now, obviously the latter scenario is preferable, but how do we get there from here? How do we locate hope and gain traction from within the same ideologies and institutions that have offered so far only hopelessness and inaction in the face of climate change? Many of our most important enlightenment institutions, such as our liberal constitutional legal system, have been implicitly premised on an assumption that humanity's narrative is one of overall progress, that the arc of history is indeed bending toward justice, that innovation and economic growth will indeed continue apace, that respect for rights and the rule of law will continue to take root and foster peace and security in the world. I hope all of those assumptions prove true, but we may be wise in light of the climate crisis to explore alternatives that assume otherwise, to consider what principles of justice and morality, what methods of social ordering might be needed for the more pessimistic valence of the climate centuries. Put another way, how can we surpass the enlightenment values that enabled in less than three centuries a mode and a scale of human existence that now threatens the survivability of all life on earth? Individualism, liberalism, capitalism, materialism, colonialism, this spasm of isms that erupted in just the blink of an evolutionary eye and that is seemingly and unwittingly provided the operating code for the planet's sixth great extinction. How can we salvage what is worthy and good in those enlightenment isms while abandoning the hubris, the imperialism, the human exceptionalism, the tendency to dominate and destroy in the name of progress? How can we pursue and realize what Sheila Jasanoff has enticingly called a second enlightenment? It's easier to frame questions like that than it is to answer them. As I'm entering now the rough ground portion of the talk, and as I confess, confessed at the outset, I'm gonna work here just by gesturing now in what I believe to be promising directions rather than offering an analysis that would pass, say, a Dale Jameson test. Within the world of climate change policy, a radical concession to politics and pragmatism takes the form of carbon offsets. Under this approach, power plants, factories, other regulated emitters can satisfy their greenhouse gas emission reduction requirements by purchasing carbon credits that have been awarded through some official process, such as the clean development mechanism under the Kyoto Protocol. Credits under these mechanisms are awarded when a project in a non-regulated jurisdiction is less greenhouse gas intensive than it otherwise would have been in the absence of outside financial sponsorship. So for instance, if a traditional coal-fired power plant normally would have been built, but financial support from a project sponsor leads it instead to be a lower emitting natural gas plant, then the project can earn credits representing the difference in emission trajectories between those two respective technologies. These credits can then be sold in the international carbon market for use by entities that are subject to emissions limitations. The idea behind this offset approach is that incrementally shifting development onto a cleaner path in unregulated countries is likely to be a much cheaper way to reduce emissions than direct cuts in regulated countries. In theory, the, the approach also has the benefit of channeling additional development dollars to those unregulated, typically poorer nations. In practice, critics point to numerous implementation and enforcement problems with offsets. Documenting what would have happened in the absence of financial support is far more of an art than a science, though the acceptability of the offset system depends on its appearance as the latter. The most fundamental critique of the carbon offset approach is that it fails to incentivize the kind of dramatic structural transformation towards a low carbon future that is so desperately needed. Even offset defenders acknowledge that the approach at best can achieve only minor changes to a business as usual development trajectory. Yet the world's problem today is that business as usual, even a marginally improved version of it, is a fast train to disaster. The impotence of the offset system in this respect is driven by its dependence on a narrow, essentially neoliberal imagination. 
carbon offsets are a compliance device that we've been told is necessary for the establishment of an efficient global carbon market, which we've been told is the only practical way to regulate greenhouse gas emissions. What's especially fascinating about carbon offsets to me is that they explicitly rely on legal imagination. They are in essence counterfactual carbon, legal instruments designed to represent and monetize the emissions that would have existed in a hypothetical business as usual version of the world without the intervention of an agent who's credited with having shifted downward the collective carbon trajectory. But once we admit the possibility of counterfactual carbon as a basis for distributing economic rewards and behavioral incentives, there should be no limit to the kinds of mitigation schemes that we could concoct. Yet the offset system remains tightly anchored to a business as usual development vision. In this respect, the offset system seems politically palatable precisely because it is so consonant with the standard neoliberal path of finance and development. What would an offset scheme look like that could reside within a neoliberal framework like ours without being limited by its imagination? Consider a system of what we might call carbon upsets. Rather than award credits based on economic development that moves us from an imagined dirty path toward a marginally cleaner but still very dirty future, why not award credits to legal and political actions that have possibly a more dramatic effect? For instance, rather than transfer money to logging operations for incremental replanting programs, why not award credits to forest dwelling communities that fight successfully to stop logging altogether? Rather than bribe powerful fossil fuel companies to stop flaring natural gas, why not reward indigenous groups that entirely block new resource exploitation activ activities on their lands? Rather than finance the construction of biogas digesters, at industrial livestock farms? Why not award upset credits to neighbors and their lawyers for suing in nuisance law to shut the facilities down entirely? Upset credits could be awarded directly to groups and individuals when they work to achieve climate progress on their own. In addition, as with the existing offset approach, benefits could be shared in the case of legal and political activities that are sponsored by a financial partner. So imagine just for a moment a world in which global financial houses like Goldman Sachs devote their considerable intellectual, financial, and political capital not to the exploitation of dubious carbon offset opportunities, but instead to the identification and promotion of critical sites of political intervention by disempowered voices for sustainability. The carbon upset approach is targeted at challenging the political and economic inertia of the status quo. It seeks to introduce a kind of endogenous rationality into our political economy by actively seeding disruption and potential transformative change. Conventional, conventional climate change policies, such as carbon offsets, have the perverse effect of further subsidizing already massively subsidized and politically dominant industries and their financial partners individuals and groups that are instead pursuing the demise of such industries should be rewarded and even encouraged into existence through carbon upsets. Again, nothing in the logic of carbon, off carbon offsets prevents their use in this more dramatic and politically ambitious fashion. The upset approach has the same counterfactual framework as carbon offsets but it admits into consideration the role of activism and law and politics in reducing emissions, not just finance and development. By enriching and empowering agents that stand diametrically opposed to the interests of business as usual beneficiaries of the fossil fuel economy, the carbon upset approach would offer a glimpse into a political imagination that does not embrace the end of the world as an inevitable side effect of economic power. Instead, the carbon economy would be turned against itself so that a new political economy might eventually emerge. The offsets uh, systems tethering to neoliberal imagination is even more plain when we shift to the case of voluntary offsets. Unlike the compliance offset market, which exists to enable firms that face emission caps to more cheaply meet their regulatory obligations, the voluntary offset market is targeted at individuals and organizations that wish to purchase credits to voluntarily offset 
their emissions, even in the absence of legal mandates. Greenhouse gas mitigation on this approach occurs through decentralized choices generally made within the context of market transactions. Before completing an airline ticket purchase, for instance, passengers are given the opportunity to offset their flight emissions for an additional fee. Before indulging in a porterhouse steak, a diner might be asked whether she wants to accept a surcharge from the restaurant with which the restaurant will purchase credits to offset her carbon intensive order. On this approach, the neoliberal order, again, is not threatened. Indeed, it's reinforced because the voluntary offset system, like the compliance offset system, obscures the deeply political nature of collective decisions. Conveniently, agency and efficacy are seen to reside in individual economic choices in the market, rather than in mechanisms for political decision making. The yawning chasm between individual actions and collective consequences, perhaps the defining feature of climate change as a global conundrum, is bridged through this conjuring magic of counterfactual carbon. But the bridge is illusory. Individuals are denied a way to imagine and realize an alternative world in which their choices do not contribute to climate change and therefore do not demand offsetting in the first place. That conversation is one that many are aching to hold for our collective climate consciousness is finally awakening to the scale of the crisis before us. But the salient templates for that conversation remain distinctly neoliberal and inadequate. As a result, public discourse now features plenty of debate and hand-wringing regarding the individual ethics of having children, of eating meat, of traveling via airplane, owning a car, and so on. There is comparatively little conversation regarding the structure and regulation of food systems, electricity grids, public transportation networks, or any of the other assemblages that determine the level of harm to be anticipated from individual decisions. To be sure, this emerging climate responsibility discourse is an advance over prior iterations in which consumers tended to be offered LED light bulbs and other convenient consumerist alibis that are relatively disconnected from the major determinants of human choice and environmental impact. But the conversational template still remains radically individualistic and I think truncated. Consider from this framework the decision whether to have children which many now see as a profound moral question from the climate perspective. With good reason, the choice to have a child is likely the single most substantial choice an individual can make with respect to their personal carbon footprint. Now, under the current carbon market system, an individual who was concerned about the greenhouse gas emissions of her offspring would have to purchase offsets representing the expected additional contribution of the child and its generational descendants to the climate problem. According to one study, this would represent nearly 60 tons of CO2 equivalent emissions per year. If we assume a conservative carbon price of $50 per ton, the conscientious parent would need to purchase 3,000 US dollars per year of offset credits in order to offset the impact of deciding to have a child or alternatively in a different political economy, the voluntarily childless might be entitled to a $3,000 per year credit award for having chosen not to have children. Either way, the critical point is, whichever scheme is adopted, the environmental and regulatory consequences of the decision are tiny in comparison to the impact that having or not having a child bears on one's life course. Consider another example, this one involving the creation of non-human animals. Researchers estimate 96% of terrestrial mammalian biomass now consists of either humans or animals grown for human use and consumption. That is, of all the mammals now living on Earth's land, scientists estimate only 4% by weight are wild animals. So we humans have re-engineered the tree of life to suit our purposes. And those billions of cattle, sheep, pigs, and poultry that we have brought into the world hold consequences for the climate. According to the UN, approximately 14.5% of global anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions are attributable to livestock. Now for the individual who wants to avoid contributing to this aspect of the global climate dilemma, the options are limited. 
As noted above, we could purchase voluntary carbon credits of dubious empirical quality to offset meat consumption. More reliably, we could forego the consumption of meat altogether. Yet even that relatively significant alteration of diet would have an utterly indiscernible effect on the climate or the well being or the numerosity of industrial farmed animals. Because we exist embedded in systems not of our choosing and well beyond our control, our greenhouse gas emissions have a certain unbearable lightness. They are light in the sense that our choices within systems give rise to emissions with little thought or means to avoid them. They are light in terms of the actual environmental impact they cause on their own when disaggregated from the emissions of billions of other individuals. And they are light in comparison to the economic costs or benefits they might bring to us within currently imaginable regulatory schemes. Yet despite their lightness, they are unbearable when we countenance them as beings with agency and responsibility who wish to be ethical in the Anthropocene. Again, how can we salvage what is worthy and good in our various enlightenment isms while abandoning the tendencies that have brought us so far out onto the melting ice? Again, it's easier to frame such a question than to answer it. And so rather than venture an answer now, I'm going to instead gesture through a concluding story, a story about a newt. <clears throat> Three years ago, I had the good fortune to be hiking with my daughter in Vermont when we stumbled upon a small pond that was teeming with juvenile red spotted newts. I grew up in a rural wooded area in Southern Indiana and I spent most of my free time as a child outdoors. My engagement with the more than human world was routine. And there seemed to be so much of the more than human world. Animals were everywhere during my childhood. Now, when I stumble upon a pond filled with newly born amphibians, it feels like an event worth telling about. My daughter, who I'll call Sunny in these remarks, had never seen newts in her lifetime, so we devoted that afternoon to continue com communing with them. I carefully scooped one of the young newts up in my cupped hands and I let Sunny hold it. She was four years old at the time, and she wasn't then and she's not now a calm child. She's more of the hyperkinetic, hypertalkative sort. But with this filmy alien in her hand, she was transformed. She became utterly entranced, perfectly still unreservedly present. After a few minutes in the thrall of the tiny creature, Sonny whispered to me, I bet she thinks I'm a giant. And then after a pause, she added, I hope she knows I'm a gentle giant. What I loved about that moment is that it showed my daughter's grasp of some important truths that are undeniable about the human animal relation. Scientists, philosophers, and lawyers, we tend to define truth as that which cannot be doubted, but there are other ways of knowing, including knowing that which cannot be denied. One thing Sonny appeared to accept as an undeniable truth in that moment was that the non-human animal in her hand was a subject with a perspective on the world that deserves consideration. Sonny called the newt she, not in an anthropomorphizing way, but simply because Sonny hadn't yet learned to depersonify her fellow creatures as it. She speculated on what the newt was thinking, not in an effort to elevate its standing in a ladder of life, but simply because she hadn't yet learned to confine the label thinking to the eccentricities of human consciousness. At the same time, Sonny also seemed to sense the unbridgeable gap between her and this other, other mind. Sonny said, I hope she knows, recognizing that any mutual understanding between her and the newt must rest on faith and belief as much as reason and evidence. Importantly, though, Sonny did not shy away from this yawning chasm. Quite the contrary, she seemed to relish the opportunity to commune with animate mystery. And it was a communion. Despite knowing she could not know what the newt knows, Sonny still described herself as being in relation with this other. The relationship had two notable features. First, Sonny saw that she is, in her word, the giant, 
even at four years old, she seemed to sense her awful power as a member of the species Homo sapiens. But Sunny also imbued the relation with ethical dimensions that exceed power. Sunny constituted herself in relation to the newt as a gentle giant. Now, as a fact witness to the events, I can attest that Sunny was incredibly gentle with the one ounce wonder of life coiled in her hand. In that little moment, she seemed to demonstrate Emmanuel Levinas's truth that we do not arrive in the world as subjects first. We are instead called into being by others to whom we are infinitely ethically obliged. We are individuated through our relations to others, and in particular to those others who are absolutely vulnerable to our existence. In Levinas's philosophy, do not kill me, is the wordless utterance issued by an inscrutable other that first calls us into being at all. I hope I don't sound grandiose if I tell you that I believe Sonny likewise heard the newt compel her, do not kill me. In telling the story of Sonny and the newt, I hope to center questions regarding our ethical responsibility to non-human life. In humanity's relationship with animals and nature, humans hold all the power perhaps now more so than ever with this power amplified exponentially through industrial formations like the animal agriculture industry and technologies like germline genetic engineering. How we use our power over animals is a vital test of our moral character and our role as stewards of life. In telling the story of Sunny and the Nude, I also hope to set up a contrast between the ethical imagination that I saw in her engagement with that other life form and the dearth of imagination that I find in much of our present response to the Anthropocene. Even the term Anthropocene reflects something of a lack of imagination. As the climate justice scholar Maxine Burkett notes, the term seems to suggest that our current predicament arose as an inevitable consequence of something fundamental about and common to all of humanity. But that narrative is false. Climate change and the other ecological ills plaguing us today arose from a very distinctive form of human, one that spread from Europe and with its spasm of isms, brought about a relationship to the earth qualitatively different from anything precedent in our existence. We are in the midst of the sixth great extinction event in the planet's history, and we are well on our way to fashioning a climate that's incompatible with stable social existence. It would seem unlikely if the worldviews and institutions that gave rise to this crisis will also be the ones that solve it. Yet we also seem incapable of escaping those worldviews and institutions, of stepping outside of our imagination, even when our survival might well depend on it. This inability to imagine an alternative to the end of the world is telling and terrifying. The newt is there, cupped in our hands, Will we giants be gentle? Thank you. Great, thank you so much for that beautiful talk. Um, I uh, said, we've said this many times, but one of the disadvantages of the Zoom format is that we can't hear the applause. So I would like to take a moment to imagine the roar of the audience 